Hey there, Accursed. It's time for Curse of Politics, starring Christy Clark and Scott Reed. This is the only podcast that mixes very astute takes on politics with very bad takes on contemporary music. We really shit the bed last week, I want to tell you. Um, heard a lot about it. And uh, we got to drag ourselves out of the 70s, which is why I have the Beach Boys up behind me today. Um we back in time. There's a lot to talk about today, kids. There's movement on the Ontario polls, maybe. What might have caused that? Polyev momentum is growing, but is he going too far with the tax on the Bank of Canada? Our clipping today asks, what's going on in Quebec? Plus, before we collapse under our own weight, we'll offer up a hey you. But first, Jesus Christ, Guy Lafleur died. Yeah. Yeah. The Demon Blonde. It's uh, it's gruesome. It's just the worst thing. He was my boyhood idol. He was like when you're 11 and you love something the way I loved the Habs when I was 11. Um, like Guy Lafleur filled the stars. You know, he just was the sky to me. So it's just awful. Like that 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 ceremony last night. Did you get the chance to see the tribute, David? I didn't. I hope I'll be oh. able to find it on video somewhere. But oh, uh, I've got it. I'll send it to you. It's uh. It was just, it, it was, it reminded me in 1996, Christy, in 1996, David and I, with a couple of others, Cyrus and uh, David Miller, we all went down to catch the final game in the forum, right? And at the end of the night, or at the beginning of the night, I should say, actually, was it, was it prior to the game? I think it was prior to the game, right? They brought all the captains out, uh, all the former captains out. And when Rocket came out and they held a torch, and when Rocket came out and they passed the torch to him, the crowd stood and cheered for over 10 minutes. And last night's tribute, I think, was the only thing that I've ever seen in sports that approached it. Because, there were, again, there was a 10-minute tribute to Lafleur. Uh, the crowd just refused to sit down, right? They tried to interrupt him a couple times, and the crowd just had none of it. Yeah. Well. Yeah. You know, it, it's such a huge part of my childhood. I, I, I actually <clears throat> remember writing my brother a letter about Guy Lafleur when, I, when he was a rookie. And my brother had gone away to university, and I actually wrote William a letter about Guy Lafleur and about how he was doing as a rookie and whether he was living up to expectations or whether it was disappointing. I remember meeting Guy Lafleur for the first time outside the forum. I had gone to see a game where they played the New Jersey Devils, who were terrible. And they lost to the Devils. And I was standing outside the forum, and Lafleur came out. And I said hi and asked him something. I can't remember what it was. And I remember him saying to me, you know, he said, some days it feels like the old days, and some games I just can't do anything. Hmm. Wow. Wow. Words from a giant. Advice from a yeah. giant, eh? Light words to live by, oh, you know? Tell me about it. Um <laughs> I never met him. I, it, you know, I just, you know, obviously we got to know Ken very well and I got to know Bob Keeney a bit. Um, and, you know, those teams meant so much to me, those 70s teams. But it was Lafleur, Lafleur who stood above and apart from them all. And I never got the chance to meet him. Ken arranged for me to get a photo uh, signed by him once. You know, but, like, I never got I never got to meet him. So I would, I would, I would treasure that memory if I were you, David. I would, uh, I would love to have met him. You know, William went to a uh, William went to a Habs fantasy camp I remember. and got to center a line between Lafleur and Shut in a scrimmage. Can you imagine? I just no, I cannot. I cannot imagine. Mm -hmm. I can't. Yeah. I would have burst into flame with. <laughs> <laughs> All right, kids. Let's let's get into it. Ontario. For months, we have been seeing polls that showed Ford in the high 30s majority territory, with the Liberals and the NDP essentially tied in the mid-20s. Two polls last week were very different. There were three, in fairness, and one was the same. But two were very different. Two showed Ford in the mid-30s, not the high 30s, with the Liberals only a few points behind in the low 30s and the NDP well behind in the low 20s. That's a very different scenario for this election, very different scenario for all three parties, but particularly for Ford. And I'm looking at it, and I'm wondering what could possibly have caused it. 
because there didn't seem to me to have been any seismic event in Ontario politics in the last month or so that would have caused that kind of shuffling around. Anybody got a theory? What might have moved in Ontario? Well, it could be a blip in the poll. I mean, it could be, a, they, you know, there's lots of rogue polls out there that don't, you know, that don't yeah. capture what's going on. But you're right, it's two of them uh, capturing something similar that's happening. I mean, I, I my best guess on it is that people look at Ford and they think he shouldn't get a free ride. And lots of those voters are coming back. And maybe people are looking at Trudeau. And after the huge, I mean, I think he took a real hit from the truckers stuff. I don't think he came off looking looking at all like a leader in any of that. But I do think the federal government has looked pretty good on the Ukraine part. And so it may be that kind of federal liberals are starting to reattach a little bit. You're starting to see just the liberal liberal brand going up in Ontario. Having said that, though, David, I mean, he's got real game on the ground Ford. I mean, those guys just have a machine out there and it's, and, you know, it's still reasonably far apart. And I just feel like, okay, even if the two polls are correct, and there's been a little bit of a bounce for the liberals. I still think it's going to be really tough for them to put together a ground game. That's going to beat Ford. Yeah. I, I think that he's got a more sophisticated operation partially because he's got more money. Right. Right. Christy, in your re-election campaign, I don't remember. So in your your first re-election, did you did you see a collapse of your support in the first week? Because very often an, uh, an incumbent will get into the campaign a week before the campaign, the first week of the campaign, and they'll see um, they'll see polls dip. You know, like kind of almost as sort of like people take attention. They go, all right, my first take is going to be uh, just to punish the incumbent a little bit. And then it's almost like the election resets and people pay attention to a, what matters to them in the election. But did that happen with you? You may have forgotten that Christie's win, Christie's first win in 2017 is one of the great comeback wins Absolutely. in Canadian history. 2013, yeah, yeah. yeah. 2013, sorry. I'm yeah. thinking of the re-election. And I, and I know, Scott, that happens a lot. Um, but in my case, we started out like 22 points behind. There was no <laughs> in your re-election no, campaign. No, in, the, in, our, in well, I, got, I got elected premier in 2011. Yeah, because I, we became leader of the party, yeah. and then our first general election was 2013, and we were 22 points behind the NDP. We, there was no like we were at rock bottom. I remember that. There wasn't yeah, really sure. anywhere lower to go at that point. So I'm not a good example of that, but I do I do hear what you're saying. And then, but you know, people came back to us after just like a con the constant beat down from the media and the opposition and people kind of decided that especially women that you know what this wasn't really fair they weren't really giving us a fair shot and there were some other issues with it too but that was part of it that that sort of changed it so who knows that could be part of what's happening for del duca people are looking and saying look you know maybe he's not that bad after all i do think i do think though in this case scott it's more what you described which is the little dip before you come back out because that's when the ground game really matters too right what you're doing in terms of how you're spending your money where you're spending it what kind of advertising you're putting up but I do think the polls are going to, you know, have got to be a, a word of warning to Ford. He's not going to get a, he's not going to get a cakewalk. So I have surely, the, surely the NDP liberal thing is a little bit more interesting even than the Ford thing, yeah. because, you know, sure. Ford dropped a few points and he's probably out of majority territory at 35, 36 points. Um, depends on the splits that he gets. It doesn't look like he's going to get a great split. I think what's interesting is we've been talking about this liberal NDP primary to see who gets to be the fundamental challenger to Ford in the election. And that looked all this time unclear as to who was going to emerge that way. But these polls would indicate that the anti-Ford vote starting to coalesce around the Liberals. I've got to believe, Christy, to follow up on what you were saying, that that has as much to do with federal politics as anything right now. Uh, and maybe the Liberal brand just seems to Ontarians like the more likely brand to beat Ford than the NDP brand does. Is there a scenario, though, if you want to follow this thread of the federal, you know, this reflecting federal politics, where the NDP, where Ford says, look, you guys, NDP are going to elect a bunch of people, Liberals are going to elect a bunch of people, and guess what you're going to end up with? You're going to end up with a coalition government. Just already like saying it. Ottawa. They're already yeah. saying yeah. it. And I think sure. that's got resonance because I don't think people like this screwy kind of, what do you mean we're not going to get to have an election because you guys are cooking the books behind the behind the curtain. I I don't think it's going to sell. And I think if he keeps hammering on that, it will. I, I think that's, I, I think it's good outcome for him. 
Surely they'll say that every day of the campaign. Yeah. If you don't elect a Ford majority, you're going to get a liberal NDP coalition. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not convinced that that's going to freak people out to the same degree that they think. I think that, um, um, well, we'll have to see, but I, I think two things. I, I think there's two possibilities of what's going on right now. I mean, first, to give the Liberals credit, and then, of course, I'm going to withdraw it, but just to go through the exercise, to give the Liberals credit, <laughs> uh, but to give the Liberals credit, they've, for the last 10 days, you know, or more, including today, by the way, they've pursued a strategy of day in, day out, you pay attention, you don't pay attention, doesn't stop us, we're going to make an announcement each day. They've made policy announcement after policy announcement that I think has been intended to signal to center-left voters and to left voters and to flat out, not even center-left voters, to also to left voters, that they're a welcoming place. So you've got a handgun policy. Uh, you've got, uh, today they're out saying they're going to uh, boost uh, the seniors' benefit, right? Uh, get a thousand, much as $1,000 uh, for seniors. They said they're going to plant 800 million trees. Who the fuck is going to fall for that goddamn thing? But anyway, anyhow. Yeah, we tried. It didn't work. I know, like everywhere, the federal government. We're going to plant 50 million trees. We're going to plant a tree like in your car. We're going to plant a tree in your car, and it's going to be wind-powered. And, uh, you know, but anyway. so I'm amazed they, at how difficult, apparently, it is to do. Supposedly, it's really difficult. I don't know why not. We planted a tree at my cottage. It took a half a case of beer and an afternoon. It didn't seem hard. Um, but anyway... Uh, you know, they, they're going to, a cabinet, push. I wrote them all out. Like, it's quite a string, right? There's a, um, uh, you know, hiring diversity policy among the uh, police forces, anti-racism, uh, end of streaming in grade nine, grade 10. So, I mean, one thing you could look at and you could say, if you're within the liberal campaign, you'd be saying, hey, guys, it's tracking, it's taking. Maybe the whole world isn't paying attention, but to the NDP switchers, they're saying, hey, you know what? I'm not freaked out by Del Duca. I'm not freaked out by the liberal brand. I think these guys are just as good a place for me uh, as possible. And so you're seeing that migration. I don't think that's likely because I just don't believe that people know about these policies. I think there may be a logic in them. They're trying to build some foundation that, that makes them acceptable to those voters, but I don't believe that it could have worked this fast. So I'm with you, David. I think it's federal politics, but I don't think it's the liberals. I don't think it's the liberals' performance on Ukraine. I don't think it's where people are at. I think that What's happening is that what what are people talking about in politics these days? They're talking about Pierre Polyev. They're talking about Pierre Polyev. They're talking about big rallies. And they're talking about this sort of looming battle between people who say, I want to burn down our institutions. And other people are going, well, I don't want to fucking do that. And that's becoming the dominant discussion in Canadian politics. And I think maybe in Ontario, I mean, you look at these polls in 416 and 905, yeah, that burned down the institutions, part, Pierre Polyev grievance politics stuff has got a lot of traction, but it's also got a lot of resistance. And I wonder if it's causing, um, it doesn't so much necessarily mean, you know, like people are cascading away from forward, but I wonder if it takes people to wait and well, wait a minute, I actually know what the liberal brand is about. I know it's not for that. And I wonder if it's causing some coalescence around that. That's So my theory, and this is going to be a boring pod because almost everything I say about politics right now starts with, well, Pierre Polyev, bop, bop, bop. Um, I think it may be a Polyev effect. Hmm. One of the prime directives for making these podcasts is that we plant seeds, always seeds of thought, sometimes seeds of disruption when they're warranted, Ultimately, seeds of, you may disagree completely with something on the program, but at least you're hearing a healthy debate about it. So, can a cell phone be a seed? That may seem like an odd question, but you know I wouldn't have asked it without some backup. Because you hurly burlyites are whip smart, you've already guessed that it comes from our presenting sponsor, TELUS, and their commitments to ESG, environmental, social, and governance. So here's how a cell phone can be a seed. In celebration of Earth Day, TELUS is on mission to plant its one millionth tree. That's 20,000 acres of gorgeous Canadian forest. Here's how it works. For every customer of TELUS or Kudo or Public Mobile who buys a certified pre-owned cell phone, TELUS will plant a tree in partnership with Tree Canada. They've already planted 800,000. They've got about 200,000 to go. Trees, as you know, keep the planet breathing. And certified pre-owned devices are Earth-friendly too, not to mention budget-friendly, because they extend the lifespan of smartphones and keep them out of landfills. This buy one, plant one campaign 
is part of TELUS's commitment to reduce its carbon footprint right now and become zero waste carbon neutral by 2030. TELUS is a company driven by social purpose to use their world leading technology for good across agriculture and healthcare, sustainability, bridging the digital divide and providing connectivity for all Canadians coast to coast, putting the well-being of their customers, communities and the planet first. We're going to be talking a hell of a lot more about all of this over the coming weeks, Hurley Burleyites, but because you're the curious types, you can read more about it now. And TELUS has just released Sustainability and ESG Report at telus.com slash sustainability. What do you think about the fact that the NDP federally have kind of disappeared? So just to build on this, it's the federal thing. Uh, I mean, you know, the, the especially since this agreement, the NDP seemed kind of out of the play. Um, and so maybe their, you know, just brand awareness is diminishing. And it seems like, to your point, it's Polyev versus the liberals that are the combatants in this fight. Well, isn't, and isn't that kind of, to, this is what's been going on for what, 10 years, the 10 years Trudeau has been in power, right? This is the alt, this is the end game for their big play, which is turn the liberals into new Democrats, move them, move the political center to the left and kind of just take over that territory. And, you know, they did it through the virtue signaling and the talking and, and Trudeau was such a great brand. He had all that mojo out there on the campaign trail. He doesn't have all that mojo anymore, but now they're just announcing it. They're saying, yeah, guess what? We are the new Democrats. We are governing with the new. What do you need the new Democrats for when you've got us? That's kind of their new message. It's not, you know, Trudeau is a great leader and he's going to be all full of virtue and nice things for you. It's guess what? We're really on the left now. And so now there really is. You're quite right, David. There are two parties in Canada. Um, and unless the NDP can come up with a compelling leader, which they are so far from having right now, um, we're back, we're to a two party system in Canada, and it's not like a two party system we had before, where they were fighting for the center. It's two parties where they're fighting for the edges. The irony, Christy, though, is that Polyev's going to leave so much space in the center that if the Liberals move left, they leave those centrist voters with a conundrum. But if the Liberals were to tack slightly back to the center. They could scoop up all those voters and they can still get the NDP votes with an anti Polyev uh, scare campaign at the end. And right? I think, so, I, actually, I think Polyev yeah. represents a repositioning opportunity for the Liberal Party if it chooses to take it. I, I think there's evidence that that may be what they're doing already. I mean, one of the, and this is actually an argument in favor, building off what you were saying, um, Christy, it's an argument in favor of the coalition deal, of uh, the, uh, the, whatever they call it, the CNS, uh, CNS cereal, yeah, sub, right? Like BFA. CNS uh, breakfast cereal. I think it's, it's a confidence and supply frosted, agreement for yeah, Christ's sake. Frosted Lucky Charms. Um, but I, I mean, it, it, it sort of, it creates an inherent structural problem for the NDP in that for the liberals, it means that they can, they can respond to events, right? Because they can take the NDP for granted now. Right. Like unless they do something that's flagrant. Right. They can kind of take the NDP for granted. And if they are of a mind to respond in the way that you suggest, David, and I hope they are, they can sort of say, well, maybe we need to like I'm watching what's happening here. I'm going to move a little bit more into the center. OK. All right. We're going to amplify how much we talk about economic policy. Try to sound a little more bread and butter. They can kind of take the NDP for granted, and it leaves them it, it leaves them struggling. But back in Ontario, one other thing I want to mention that today is a dynamic day. It's Monday morning, and the NDP are releasing their platform. And I think what's also you you start you start to talk you talk about people sort of bouncing around the political spectrum, uh, and in terms of their uh, utilization of traditional campaign issues, the NDP are now going to be the uh, party of middle class tax cuts. Right. So their big centerpiece policy, according to our friend Rob Benzie uh, at the Toronto Star, is going to be that they want to any household with fewer than two hundred thousand dollars, less than two hundred thousand dollars in income will see their taxes frozen under NDP government for four years. Um, and I think, you know, it's interesting. The liberals feel like the Ontario liberals, right, feel like, well, we've got to do handgun and de-streaming and anti-racism and have an anti-racism cabinet. And they go like very left policies to try to appeal to that NDP vote. And the NDP are sort of going, man, we need some kind of like bread and butter, economic cost of living sort of uh, discussion. And, it, you know, it's it's going to be interesting how this unfolds, because ultimately, I think we do know that this issue of cost of living 
is surely going to be the ballot question. Like it isn't going to be about, do you want the liberals or the NDP? How do you feel about which one is better going to represent your values? Fuck, man. That's not how elections work, right? It's going to be like, which one of these folks is more, is going to do something about the cost of a hamburger? You know, the <clears throat> Peter Weltman, the independent financial officer of Ontario, was on the Hurley Burley last week. And we worked it through. He explained to me that the province is going to go from like, $10 billion deficits to $7 billion surpluses over the next five years entirely on the backs of inflationary tax receipts. Yeah. Um, entirely Nominal on GDP. the backs of a flood of revenue that comes from inflation. So the GDP is crappy. There's no real growth in the economy, but the nominal GDP, which is what the tax base is based on, is rising like crazy, right? Right. That seems like a pretty big opportunity for somebody to walk into platform wise. It does, except that, you know, they what they will not account for is the fact that the vast majority of government spending goes to what? Organized labor. And guess what? Those guys are going to be demanding, and they already are across the country, huge wage increases in order to be able to accommodate um, inflation for their members. And that's going to chew up tons as they get into those contract uh, negotiations, going to chew up tons of that fiscal space. That they're, so there's kind of at the end of the day, David, you end up sort of back where you started because you can't. And, you know, and when that when the public sector starts to grow, it's you know wage inflation, in the public sector, you start to see matching wage inflation in the private sector as well. So, I mean, and that's all going to just make everything a lot worse. That is going to be the hole in the NDP promise. They will not account for the fact that on the other side, government costs, even if they don't grow government and introduce a bunch of wacky new programs that are going to be hugely expensive, which they will, you're still going to end up with just making everything we have more expensive. But that big, that, that big dividend that Peter was talking about, which by the way, is a short term circumstance, right? Nominal GDP is, uh, you know, it's, it's a sugar high, um, you know, uh, because the yep. same forces start to chew away the, the, you know, your real growth. Um, by the way, they've also banked billions of dollars that they didn't actually utilize from uh, during the pandemic, which drives me bananas. They were never really held to account for what they didn't spend in our schools, but uh, harvested from uh, federal transfers. But anyway, uh, I think the Ford is in a better position to utilize that funds because the NDP and the Liberals are, because of the wage inflation point that, uh, that Christie makes, they're going to be a little bit ham-fisted and ham-strung in terms of the choices they'll be able to publicly articulate. Whereas Ford can say, I'm going to take this big whack of cash. Hey, folks, have you heard the good news? We're going to have a balanced budget within a couple of years. Get a fucking load of me. Now, here's what we're going to do with that uh, hard-earned um Benefit. We're going to actually put it to work for you. We're going to return it to you, yada, yada, yada. Don't believe for one second that Ford isn't going to kick this campaign off on Thursday's budget with one big whack of a motherfucking tax cut. You can, but like, it just would make no sense to not compete with this cost of living thing and just take total charge of that. He doesn't have to worry about um, wage inflation in the public sector because he doesn't need to necessarily fish in that pond. If we're going to have a fight between pharmacare and a tax cut, they better take that thing to uh, the field where Pickett's charge happened, because that will be a goddamn disaster. No, don't be surprised if that's how this. Well, and nobody's going to believe the NDP on a tax cut anyway, right? I mean, Ford is just going to be way more credible in people's minds on that front. He can make it big and juicy, and and the even if it's even if it's smaller, the fact that people are going to believe it's going to happen will be enough. I think. Well, you to say on Thursday. It shows you how effective. big that 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 license sticker rebate is a big deal because you know a tax cut that delivered six hundred dollar checks to people would be an enormous tax cut. Like you don't cut personal taxes by that amount. You can't do it. I mean, they delivered. They found a mechanism to deliver a huge benefit to people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, look that that is so. Um, so attractive as a benefit that our friend Corey Tanek went out and bought Magnum P.I.'s car <laughs> with his plate rebate, rebate. And then and then he runs a red light and, and then monsters the thing. Speaking on behalf of Robin Masters, I say, man, Corey, get, take some driving lessons. Anyway, Corey's safe and sound, they say. Uh, uninjured, maybe a little Did mild Did he have a friend chopper him out? 
I don't, yeah, yeah, TJ. Is it TC? <laughs> TC? TC? TC and Rick. Rick will be at the cabana. Hey. <laughs> We have a friend who's a private eye. Uh, anyway, Corey's well, right? So we only make jokes because he's, you know, not crunched. But get get a load of that, eh? Guy buys Magnum P.I.'s car. Holy fuck. Unreal. I would buy Steve McQueen's bullet car, but, you know. Anyway, who knows whether these polls in Ontario are right, but we'll know by four, the four teams' actions. I presume nobody is doing more polling than Nick Kuvalis and Team Ford right now. So we'll know by their behavior whether something has changed. And whether the liberals are now the public enemy number one, etc. So, dear listeners, I want to talk about green. It's a thing nowadays, in case you've been tuned out. And about the greenest thing you can do is plant a tree. You know, restore the planet's lungs. Concerned people do it every day. And our sponsor, CN, is alongside them, helping. CN runs a program called Eco Connections along with its partners, Tree Canada and America in Bloom. The objective is mass reforestation of communities and First Nations along its network in Canada and the U.S. Since 2012, CN and its partners have planted more than 2.3 million trees, which makes CN one of the leading private non-forestry tree planters. The railway runs through national parks, wetlands, forests and prairies, and CN is serious about preserving them. It's more than that, of course. CN's greening policies are vast. Rail is the greenest form of cargo transport extant. That's it. That's all. Think about it. One train can take hundreds of tractor trailers off our highways. Trains don't stop at traffic lights and have minimal rolling resistance. Compared to big rig trucks or jet aircraft, a train is practically a Prius. Yes, locomotives use fossil fuel. But CN works relentlessly on reducing its carbon footprint, which has already shrunk pretty dramatically over the past several years. CN consumes about 15% less fuel per gross ton mile than the industry average. Among the big Class 1 North American railroads, CN is the most fuel and carbon efficient of all. That's really a big deal. There are corollaries to this equation too. Some of the most environmentally friendly products made move from factory to customer by train. CN trains have for years moved wind turbines from factories in Maritime Canada to wind farms in Texas. The latest electric vehicles and solar panels and high capacity batteries, they all arrive by train. CN has used technology to reduce emissions at its yards and other facilities. Ultimately, CN hopes to someday stop using even diesel. It has purchased a fleet of electric trucks to carry out last mile deliveries and has commissioned a prototype electric locomotive. Yes, that's right. Really, really big battery. CN, you see, is the railway of the future, and green is where we all want to go. But we were talking about Polyev, and let's keep talking about Polyev. Because, you know, what? what's more interesting in Canadian politics right now than Pierre Polyev? Anything? I don't think anything's more interesting than Pierre Polyev in Canadian politics right now. Mm-hmm. Um. The rally tour continues, unabated. Big crowds everywhere he goes. They're not as big in Ontario generally as they are in Western Canada, but there's certainly nothing to sniff at for any leadership campaign. I'm not going to. Uh, I'm not going to criticize them. We're a month away from the leadership cutoff. If there's, a, if this is a battle for the soul of this party, as it was reputed to be at the beginning then Sheree and Brown really seem like pretty reluctant combatants. When does this battle for the soul of the party get joined? Like every two weeks, Sheree says something mildly critical and then disappears. Mm -hmm. Like, where's the fight? Where's the fight? Yeah, I don't get it. Because, you know, Sheree is a tough fighter. I've seen him do it. We've all seen him do it. He'll get He can get up there and throw some punches, you know, on behalf of, you know, Canada and all that stuff. I don't Fucking wasn't afraid of Lucien Bouchard. Why is he afraid of Pierre Polyev? Exactly. And what's he got to lose? That's the thing that so makes it so impossible to understand. He he cannot win this without he probably can't win this, but he certainly can't win this without a fight. And it's just like gloves down, you know, kind of polite, happy talking about conservative memberships and how we vote for the party president. Who gives a shit about that? 
You know, let's talk about what we want to be as a country. Let's, he should be speaking to his strength as a uniter, as a national figure, as somebody who fought for Canada, as somebody who can speak for conservatives from coast to coast to coast, instead of, instead of this tiny sliver that Pierre Polyev seems to talk to, you know, and I think he can be attacking Trudeau as a, as a leftist. And, you know, like rather than attacking Trudeau as some kind of a, a weird, you know, what is he like some Bilderberg World Economic Forum yep. or whatever they call him, you know, George Soros. Stooge. I just think there's a lot of room there for Sheree to take this on. And if he wants to go down in history and be remembered for for doing doing this well, he's really got to fight it. I think you guys are yeah, being it's unfair. Not a speech at a convention. It's oh. day after day after day. I think you guys are being unfair to Sheree, I, and which is, you know, like, wow. Wow. I really do. Not because I think that his campaign is doing well. I think his campaign is in the ditch and can't get out. But I don't think that he is failing to say any of the things that you're suggesting he should say. I think that he talks about himself all the time as the only guy as a uniter. I think he's he went on national television and said that uh, Pierre Polyev's support for the convoy means that he ought to be he ought to be disqualified from even seeking the leadership. I mean, it was he's like six weeks ago. I know, I, but for all we know, he's saying it every fucking day, right? But he's standing in a wind tunnel. Like, the problem is that he doesn't have traction. Like, if he says something to a room of six people who bring him bread and pies because their name is Mavis, and they're just so nice to see this not lovely young Sheree fellow, like, I just, like, that's the problem. There's nothing to report. So he doesn't get any traction. He doesn't get any life. But I think there's a big danger in all of this, because I think there is no fight for the soul of the Conservative Party. The soul of the Conservative Party was settled a while ago and they want Pierre Polyev and they want populist politics and they want grievance politics and he is an outstanding um, messenger for all of that. And so he's winning and there's no fight for the soul of the Conservative Party. There will be a fight for the soul of Canada Right. Because this sets up what I think is going to be a monumental clash in the next general election. As you know, he you know, you've got time for a change after an incumbent government that's been there for a while. And obviously, Trudeau has been picking up um, picking up bumps and bruises. Um, but then you've got Pierre Polyev's brand of politics and how, you know, it attracts a lot of a lot of light, but it also attracts a lot of heat. And I just think, you know, one thing I've noticed in the past week and a half is, you know, Polyev, the strength of his campaign, the resonance of it, the stimulus and feedback that he's getting, because he's standing in front of crowds who are cheering everything he says. And the more he says outrageous shit, the more they cheer. Well, that, that can be a dangerous dynamic as a candidate, right? You start to believe your own bullshit. You start to drink your own bathwater. You start to drink your own bullshit. You got to be fucking careful, okay? And I just think that when he starts... Thinking that because his immediate surrounding and the stimulus circle that is available to him tells him it's okay uh, to shit on the Bank of Canada and to suggest by implication he'll obviously just interfere with how it operates as a politician. I think that when he, I assume implicitly referring to blackface, calls the, talks about the prime minister's quote unquote racist past, that stuff is dangerous. Okay, and as long as he's speaking, you know, to a crowd that will approve anything he says, that's fine. But at some point, you know, he's he's got to be careful because he can start to believe his own bullshit and take things too far. And some of this stuff can it won't hurt him in the leadership race. It will only help. But it's going to it, it is going to be some stuff that he's going to have to cycle back. And I, I know what his campaign is built out of. But you just you got to be careful. You just don't get ahead of yourself. And Lee's looks like a campaign that's getting too cocksure. I, you know, I think he's I, I maybe is cocksure, maybe not too cocksure because he's going to win. You know, right. so maybe I mean, maybe he's out there doing more than he needs to in order to win. He's serving up the red meat for folks. And I think he's, he'll dial it back and then he's going to have a couple, three years till the next election. And he will just spend those three years just eviscerating Trudeau. Like Trudeau is going to actually have a real tough, very yep. ugly, you know, di you know, probably to most of us, not very tasteful fight. Um, with Trudeau. And I think he's going to do Trudeau a lot of damage. I wonder if Trudeau's, I, I don't think Trudeau's going to make it to the next election. I don't think he's going to be running in the next election because I think he's going to be such damaged goods. The liberals won't, uh, 
would be wise to wise to get rid of him after Paul Liebs done his trick on him. But back to Shirai, then then your obvious replacement. Well, then you have to talk about how the replacements would do. Yeah, because if 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 you suggest that I want to get rid of the, I got, I, I'm going to take, I'm going if I'm going to pull my goalie, I got to think about who's coming in as a substitute. Yeah. Yep, and and are they better poised to stop those shots? It's true, but you know yeah, what? Pull your goalie, Scott. Wait till after the show. I, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, by the way, my mother's name was Mavis. What are the odds you would? You know, what are Lovely. the odds, Scott? Lovely, Mavis. <laughs> Lovely. Did she make? Did she make bread? She she did. She was she was just she taught hey! me. Like, oh, she taught point me made. Like, yes. There we go. We obviously have like a psychic connection, Scott. There the, we go. But, you know, I just think for Chere, at the end of the day here, he's not going to win. He's got to end this in a blaze of fire. You know, like that scene in Game of Thrones where the king of the Rohan is standing there, Rohanamin or whatever they were. And he's like, you know, he's going up and down. We are going to go to our death here. And, you know, he's banging everybody's sword. Chere has to do that. He has to walk into the jaws of death. Of Lord th- of the Rings. Huh? The that was Lord of the Rings. Was right. Oh, Riders of, of Rohan. Rohan. What did I say? Game of Thrones. Sorry, Lord Game of the Rings. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> the Riders of Rohan, very important part of the Lord of the Rings. Thank you for reminding me of the Riders of Rohan. <laughs> I don't think he's a rider. I'm... I've seen the movie like 30 times because my son loves it. So I don't know how I got that wrong. I've read you... the book a hundred times. You oh. need an army. Christy, can I ask army. you this? So Polyev has been attacking the Bank of Canada for a couple of years now for being in league with the government to finance the government's spending and to indirectly create inflation by expanding the money supply. This past week, he said that the Bank of Canada was financially illiterate and knew less than Bitcoin investors did about the economy. Is that going too far to attack an institution like that whose independence is quite central to our system? Or am I just nervously clutching my pearls? I think it's going too far. I mean, I just think... If you are a leader of a party in this country, you have an obligation to support the institutions of this country. And so it's, you know, it's it's kind of like how the Reform Party back in the day were just attacking government all the time. Government as an institution, saying terrible things about government. And government itself is an institution. The Bank of Canada is, a, is an institution. The Liberal Party of Canada, the Conservative Party of Canada, they're all institutions in our country that support democracy and support the functioning of our country. So I think he is going too far. I think it's, um, I think it contributes to this narrative that we can't trust anybody, that government is bad, that they're all a bunch of jerks and we should just get rid of them all because they're all lying to us. And how does that so, um, how does that support the underpinnings of our democratic process? Ultimately, it leaves us in a place very much like we find in the United States right now, where nobody believes anybody, anything. Everybody's all bad. There's no point in voting. All these people are liars and they're all being manipulated by some conspiratorial forces we don't see. I, you know, in that, I think um, of all of the things I object to about Polyev, it's that the most. And you, uh, Me too. But his campaign will say this, when they hear this, their reaction will be, you know, pull your pants up. Okay, scaredy, scaredy cats, tough luck. The elites are going to take a punch from us. We're going to drink soup from your skulls, motherfuckers. That's how this is going to go. That's going to be their response. And, you know, so the real test of all of this is whether or not this stuff is going to cause him political harm because he's rolling downhill at a mighty rate right now. And I, I think there and it just goes back to my central point which is that you know all things in measure like i understand that his whole fundamental appeal is that he is an unblinking grievance political polemicist right but you still have got to to make certain that you don't provide opportunities for your opponents down the road i do think that you can take this issue of oh i see so you're going to interfere with the uh with the bank of canada now you would say well that's a pointy headed elite argument well actually you can turn it into a pretty uh bread and butter issue uh if we're if we're two three years into fighting inflation and where interest rates are and where they aren't suddenly we're going to elect a guy who's going to set interest rates for himself out of the prime minister's office what else are you going to do i mean you can start to it gets a little bit uh, squeaky, and he may not find that everybody responds the way that uh, that those rallies do. And so I just I, I think they have got to be careful on this stuff. That in the zeal of 
the immediate reaction they get from the voters they have and the voters who are unjudging of them, um, that they don't lay traps for themselves. They, they, they'll, they'll, think, they'll think I'm a pale, limp of, uh, uh, excuse of, a, of an advisor for saying those things. But I, I think that, you know, unless you think you're invulnerable, you still have to consider, I might go too far at some points and create problems for myself. Because ultimately, if you burn down, as you say, Christy, if you burn down every institution, yeah. Right. Well, then what is there left for you to take over? Exactly. And if you tell people that those who are in charge can't be trusted, what do they think of you when you're the fucking one in charge? And that's exactly the problem that Jason Kenney has had. Yeah. And, you know, don't forget to we, we think of Canada as this great united country brought together by our Constitution, blah, blah, blah. We are not. We are a country of where there's a there is populism, a bubble in every provinces across the country, except probably Toronto and region, but Canada has always been a really disunited country that's been held together by a common vision around strong institutions. Like we are way less united than Americans are. They have a constitution that they all believe in and, you know, all that kind of thing. They actually have, they have, a, they've got their flag, they've got their anthem, they've got their history that's been, you know, painted writ large for them for, and they all learn about it in schools and they're, they, they, at least they all believe in some of the same things. You take a British Columbian and you put them beside an, a, a, a Quebecer, you put a Quebecer beside um, a Newfoundlander, you don't find a lot in common. We're com we are completely different and we're held together by threads that are thin and vulnerable. And that's what I worry about with this fight about the institution. Because, and remember, the whole issue about the Fed in the States really lit on fire with the Trump folks and the Republican Party. I don't think there's any reason why it couldn't be the same here. And I think that's what Polyev's betting on. Yeah, well, it's, it's so hard to defend these institutions, A, because people don't really know them or what they do or what their importance is. Most people don't know what the Bank of Canada is or what it does or why its independence is important. Most people don't know that. And, you know, we saw with Trump how little defense there is of these institutions when they're attacked because people don't like the outcomes that they're producing. And in an environment where a lot of people think the system isn't working, doesn't this put both the Bank of Canada and the government of Canada in the position of defending that system? Yes. As opposed to Polyev's talking about outcomes. Your rates are going up. Your interest rates are going up. Your money's worth less. Those people did that. Well, this is the power of these guys, right? The power of these guys is once you walk across that line, because you're not concerned about well, when I, when and if I um, take charge of, of government, I'm going to have to uh, be stewards of these institutions. If you don't give a shit about that stuff, um, then what happens is anyone who defends those institutions, right, is they've just defined themselves as part of the problem and therefore not to be dismissed. And the institutions, because they've always lived in a world that they are to be removed from politics and partisan, and partisan uh, conduct, that that is one of the things that preserves their position um, and provides them with integrity as institutions. Once they discover that, like they have no clothes like the emperor. Um, and so then they are left in a position where they it's culturally impossible for those institutions to defend themselves. They can't get into a slug match with Pierre Polyev and go, hey, like the governor of the Bank of Canada can't sort of like, you know, loosen his cravat and go, hey, you know what? Let's throw down, motherfucker. Uh, you know what? Like, let's have it out. Like, that can't, culturally, that can't occur. So you see how vulnerable in a practical world where people are willing to blow through norms, like we saw in the United States, how vulnerable those institutions are. Because they can't defend themselves. And those who might defend them are instantly defined as part of the problem. And this is why I say you got to go high and you got to go low on a guy like Pierre Polyev. You can't uh, you can't sort of sit around and, uh, you know, the tweed jacket and say, well, the people will come around and they'll never vote for that. But neither can you spend all of your time just trying to, like, you know, chainsaw him at the knees. You got to you got to come at this guy hard and constantly. Yeah. Cool. All right, kids, we got a clipping today. It comes to us again from the Canadian press. A lot of love from the Canadian for the Canadian press from the curse of politics in the last couple of weeks. Jacob Cerebrin writes about Quebec. Here's an excerpt. With the specter of a Quebec independence referendum off the table, the Liberal Party is attempting to redefine itself 
but it's struggling to appeal to French-speaking voters without losing support among Anglophones and immigrants. There's been a change in Quebec's political landscape, Valérie Anne Mejio, a political science professor at Université de Laval, said in a recent interview. We've seen a shift from partisan politics that were organized around sovereignism and federalism toward more so-called normal politics on a left-right axis, where we see parties competing on social and economic policies. The shift has been particularly difficult for the Federalist Liberals and the Sovereignist Party Québécois because the issue of Quebec's place in Canada was such a key part of their identities, Mahéo said. While the Liberals were traditionally seen as the party of the economy, the centre-right CAQ, which took power for the first time in 2018, now occupies that position in the minds of many Quebecers. So you have Legault at 44%, you have the Liberals at 17%, and you have the Parti Québécois in single digits in Quebec, may not elect a member in the next election. And Legault, who's center-right, his major opposition in the polls, in organizational momentum, and in everything, is this brand new conservative party of Quebec. Which, by the way, I think is going to be a big factor in the federal race that is unaccounted for right now. Um, but... Uh, you know, this is a really interesting scenario. Quebec has traditionally been considered the heartbeat of the progressive movement in Canada, the most small L liberal place in Canada. You know, Jean Charest's argument about why he wasn't a true blue conservative when he was the premier of Quebec is you can't be a true blue conservative and be the premier of Quebec. That culture doesn't allow it. But now we have essentially a conservative party in government and a conservative party in opposition and the liberals about to disappear into a tiny Anglo enclave and the PQ maybe disappear altogether. Pretty interesting. And it doesn't really line up well for the federal liberals, if you think about it in a federal context a couple of years down the road. I think Trudeau has played Quebec pretty well, given the obstacles there so far. I mean, I think you probably agree with that, David. The numbers show us that. Um, I... Um, this, this play looks really familiar to me because in British Columbia and Quebec, we're the only provinces where, you know, where we have these kind of weird coalition government parties that are called liberals. And, right. um, and what happens every 20 or 30 years in BC, the parties, some of the parties disappear. It doesn't happen nationally, but it happens in Quebec too. So I think what we're looking at is the, I, I don't think the liberal party will exist in Quebec Um in a few years, I think they'll be gone. They'll be displaced, and their voters will be will, will be redistributed across the spectrum. And I think um, Legault has been fa fantastic. I actually, I think he has a great finance minister in Eric Girard. By the way, I think it's probably the best finance minister in the country right now. They are um, they are finding a way to speak to people on economic um, issues, and at the same time, they're talking to those folks who are really motivated by the more kind of um, ethnocentric issues or whatever you want to call them, you know, that kind of um, we're French speaking, we want to, you know, we're proud of who we are and we always feel under threat. I just think he has got a magic political magic. I don't agree with everything that he does. I don't like, um, I don't like the, um, this secularism stuff that they're doing, but boy, he has found that sweet spot in Quebec and I think everything he's that he's at the center of the political. He's made himself the sun in the in the uh, in the, in the kind of the uh, with all of the, everybody else just a planet orbiting around him now. And I think he's gonna he's gonna be in power. His party's gonna be in power as long as they as long as they want to be in Quebec. And I think it now means you've got the federal liberals. You're right, coming in and kind of begging for scraps, trying to figure out how they're going to play in that field. Because Legault is the king of Quebec. It is not. Uh, it is not Justin Trudeau, and it certainly ain't Jean Charest and some of those guys from the old days. Um, sorry, you. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say. I mean, I, my analysis is almost limited to fiercely agreeing with the writer of the article. Like I just, you know, like I mean, I just think that the. Um, the indisputable conclusion is that um, as the fault line of Quebec politics is no longer def uh, built around uh, separatism and independence, um, those parties that were the old um, 
battle-worn soldiers in that struggle um, are having difficulty reinventing themselves and, and, and uh, you know, sort of shifting to some sort of different identity. Um, and you would expect that of the Pekis. Um Although Levesque reinvented them, they did reinvent themselves after they dropped, you know, formally dropped sovereignty uh, for a little while there in the 80, early 80s. But, I mean, there, it, you might expect it of the Pekis. It's much, it's, you know, the liberals, I think it's confounding that they've been unable to, to redefine themselves. But I, I think as, we've, as we see that independence is no longer the, the necessarily the driving force of political d- dynamic in Quebec – then it makes room for new discoveries, right? And one of the new discoveries is you can have an economic conservative party like CAC, right, be quite successful. And that still leaves plenty of room, as it turns out, for something that we didn't think existed, which is a culturally conservative party, um, like this new conservative party that they've got. And I think, you know, if you're looking at it uh, federally, you're probably thinking, hmm, that means there's some snacks to be had for me if I'm Pierre Polyev. This gives me uh, uh, maybe a new a new path, a new license in terms no, kidding. of fishing votes. I personally remain skeptical, and it's one of the, I keep going back to it. I know that everybody wants to count Trudeau out. Um, but I do think that there remains a force to the Trudeau brand personally in the province of Quebec. And I know that it's something around which people, like it draws iron filings and it repels iron filings and has done since 1967, 68, right? But I think that brand still is such a, um, I think it's uh, an overpowering factor. Um, I think for the Liberals, you got to be very, very careful federally um, to I think Pierre Polyev needs to, I think it will help him a lot in, in, in this conservative leadership race. I think we're going to find that he draws a lot out of Quebec, more than people expected. And I think there'll be a lot of overlap with that uh, culturally conservative Quebec party um, from an organizational and membership standpoint. But I think you've got to be careful about ter- thinking that's going to translate into seats for you in the federal <coughs> election. But I think the liberals have got to be very careful, too, about thinking that they can trade in Trudeau and that they are, they're going to they're going to somehow surf off the same brand uh, value in the province of Quebec. Um, it could it could it could blow up uh, the first and best claim to votes and seats that, uh, that the federal liberal party has in the province. Yeah, I mean, Polyev, from his standpoint, I mean, the Quebec I think the conventional wisdom about Quebec had been that it was going to be charade territory because he knew people. He had an organization. Nobody in the Conservative Party has an organization there. I mean, Sheer won seats, won delegates in Quebec by trolling around on supply management so that you could sell 20 memberships in enough ridings to win the delegates with 20 votes in that riding. And then O'Toole did the same thing with gun laws. But now this conservative party provincially has somewhere between 50 and 75,000 members. And from what I've read about them, they're not Sheree conservatives. They're more like Polyev conservatives. So this is a real force. And it sounds like a lot more people than Sheree has at his disposal in Quebec. So it could make the leadership even more lopsided. But it doesn't sound outside of the federal liberals like there's a strong voice for liberalism left in that province, and it may mean that the federal liberals have to play a different role in the politics of that province than they've been playing, which is pretty passive, pretty acquiescent to Legault, pretty non-confrontational. Would you argue, David, that they haven't been acquiescent to Legault already? I mean, it seems they have been. They've been doing that, and I'm wondering whether they can still hold to that or whether they've got to start more proactively creating intellectual space for us. Well, I've never, I mean, I don't, in, as a Westerner, David, yeah. I, I grew up believing, being taught by Mavis that the, in Quebec, and when it comes to the federal government, the federal liberals have never done anything but be acquiescent to Quebec, except during the FLQ crisis. That was it. That was all. And so I'm not sure, you know, I don't think anything's going to change. I don't think, I don't think it is in the, in the DNA of the federal liberal party to be anything but acquiescent to Quebec. Mm. But that's just Mavis talking. (laughs) I used to eat from the same warm rolls that Mavis made for you. And uh, that's, 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 
I don't think that's ever been truer. I think that this federal liberal government has had a policy of absolute non-confrontation um, with CAC, I think. And it's probably prudent. I don't always like it, um, but I have to be conscious of the fact that I'm a unilingual Eastern Ontario, United Empire, Loyalist, Orange Lodge kind of tradition. Like, that's what I come from. So, like, I got to be super careful about second guessing all that. It feels to me like they are probably prudently scared of a bear with large claws. And, um, and uh, I just think if you take Trudeau, uh, like we all talk, people sort of casually talk about how Trudeau won't contest the next election. I think you take him off the board for the federal Liberal Party. I wouldn't make any bets, even if they replace him with a, a, a Pierre Lane Francophone Quebecer. I wouldn't make any bets about um, the party's uh, hold on seats there. I think uh, it's really, it would be, I think it would be. But you got to think about it even more in this context. There are two uh, circumstances that I'm aware of where the political class of Quebec decided that the liberals had to go, had to be run out of Quebec. And that was by Duplessis, uh, and he supported Diefenbaker in 1958. And that was by Levesque, and he supported Mulroney in 1984. And it was pretty devastating to liberal fortunes both times when everybody who mattered at the provincial level weighed in and said, time for the federal liberals to hit the fucking road. You know what the problem is with the federal liberals, though? I mean, I'm going to bookend my comment about Quebec is that they're, they are this interventionist party. They're always trying to go in and suck up provincial jurisdiction and take away and take away and, and, and violate the terms of the BNA Act. Quebec, when they stand up, they get at the, the feds walk away. They say, OK, good. You got a good argument there. We'll let you do your thing. When W.A.C. Bennett was mad about it back in 1972, he went out along the highway, Trans-Canada Highway, and they took down all of the Trans-Canada Highway signs and changed them to the British Columbia Highway signs because he wanted no trace of Canada to be along provincial roads. And he had the power to do so. I mean, that but they didn't keep their hands off BC. They didn't keep their hands off Alberta and Ontario and Newfoundland and all the rest of the country. This is fundamentally the problem with the federal government is that they are constantly overreaching in the, across their jurisdiction. It drives Quebecers crazy. Quebecers kick them out. Drives everybody else in the West crazy. But they don't. Uh, but they don't uh, respond the same way to you know all these no but in oh. in, in, all, in 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 British Columbia it's here do this thing that we want you to do and in Quebec it's like here would you like some money to do whatever you want to do yeah. <laughs> thank you david <laughs> thank you david. mavis couldn't have said it better <laughs> the, the provincialist perspective uh, i love it i love it all right, for my money, I wish the federal government had, had its gloms all over uh, provincial policy more heavily during the pandemic. I would have liked to have seen a more interventionist government that was more prescriptive. Well, it, you know what? It worked. We did a good job in Canada on COVID. It wasn't perfect. There were lots of mistakes. That's true everywhere. But it actually worked. And you can't, Scott, imagine that the federal government could have run hospitals in Canada I mean, they only fund 20 percent of them in the first in the first instance. And second, they don't they don't have any experience at it. It would have been a disaster. Mm, could have had national mask mandates. Could have had you know, there's a lot of people who've been hanging around since the gun registry looking for something to do. Christy, we could have put them in charge of the hospitals. There we go. <laughs> you guys, man, you have no faith in the, uh, the central institutions of central uniting institutions. What next? You guys are going to show up here with defund the CBC shirts on. Fuck, I've lost you both. <laughs> no, I... I yeah, I'm not for defund the CBC. Only the people they put on the CBC are in favor of defunding the CBC. But the uh, we have to. It's time for our hey yous. But before that, I have a special announcement. A special announcement. Big news. Big news. We're having a big shift in curse of politics. Um, Christie's taking a hiatus to go pay attention to the rest of her life, and we are going starting Monday daily. Back with the indomitable Jenny Byrne to cover the Ontario election five days a week. First thing in the morning, get your curse of politics update on the Ontario election. You'll hear things you wish you hadn't heard here every morning. <laughs> Going all in provincial. You're going to love this, Christy. It's all pro provincial talk. Hey, I love it. I, you know, and I love Ontario. There you go. Perfect. Ladies and gentlemen. 
please return to your seats. The hey yous are about to begin. So this is Christie's last hey you for a month or so. And maybe you want to start. Okay. Um, well, I'm going to, again, I'm going to speak to Jean Charest, my old pal. And I'm going to say, dig deep, brother. Find it within yourself. Go down a flame. Go back and watch Lord of the Rings. See that scene where the men of Rohan are coming together. I mean, he's got to go down with the with the argument hot in his mouth. He's got to say, you know, he's got to end this campaign with being on the right side of history, because otherwise I think people will forget the rest of his great contribution to the country. And I think all of us, um, we all know this isn't going the right direction for him, but go down with a fight. That's always the way to end it. If you have to end it, if you have to end it on the losing side. There you go. Sound advice to Jean Charest from Canada's best closer. Nobody closed election campaigns out better than Christy Clark. There we go. All right. Well, my hey you is decidedly more uninteresting. My hey you is wholly rooted in process. Um, my hey you is to the federal government, and it's this. For the past two weeks, you've been doing what are known as echoes. Echo announcements from the budget. Oh, we went to Niagara. Oh, we went to Surrey. Oh, we went to Regina. We picked up on something we funded in the federal government's last budget, and we re-announced it with local stakeholders, with a city councilor, maybe a mayor or two. And they had ministers run off their feet, literally run off their feet. Didn't get a second to be at home with their families during the Easter break, during those two weeks. They were all fanned out everywhere, doing announcements, trying to sustain all that. And my hey you is this. I don't think it works. I'm not sure it ever worked, but that is add water and stir political communication, government political communication. We bring down the budget, then we do that before the break week, then we send everybody out on the road to do a housing announcement, to talk about something else we funded, to say, look at this super cluster that's going to get refinanced. And you don't actually talk or connect to people. All you really do is you talk to stakeholders. And maybe that's good enough, but it feels like the professional class speaking to the professional class. And it's not even... Uh, hardly reported anymore. It just sort of bops along and there's the illusion, the mirage of activity of, uh, you know, you can do an Excel sheet and say, Jesus Christ, we've got, we've got all the pistons firing in this federal government cabinet engine of ours. But I'm not certain when I watch the conservative leadership race, when I look at what's happening on social media, when I think about what's dominating our politics and our discussion, that the sort of post-budget, break-week, fan government ministers out to do echo announcements, I don't think that works anymore. And I think it needs to be brought back to code, rethought, and I think if you've got a bunch of talent... Figure out a better way to employ it. You got a bunch of technology, figure out a better way to harness it. You got a bunch of content you think is going to connect with people, find out a better way to get it in front of those people. So I don't think it works. And this isn't just a complaint of the federal government. All governments do it. But I think all governments have sort of been doing it these last few years because they've always been, in, that's, that's the template and that's what they do. And I think it sucks and I don't think it's working. And I think that... Um, you got to do stuff that works uh, because there's a guy marching down the hill with a fucking spear uh, and um, and you got to stop him and you're not going to do it with stuff that doesn't work. And he's I think if people, I, I think if liberals, I think if liberals knew how few people even know about the child care program, much less anything else, they'd be disheartened. Yep. Well, it's been a pleasure, guys. Well, we're it certainly has been. My hey you, I've got a hey you. My hey you says, Ontario politicians, the forecast for economic growth in the province going forward is projected to be less than 2% annually as far as the eye can see. That will feel like a constant recession. In this budget coming up this week and in this provincial election coming up, let's hear some ideas about creating more money that we can all spend together and enjoy. Right on. Because we need to think about that a little bit. Christy, it's been nothing but an absolute joy to have you on this show. I've just loved it. I know Reed has been intimidated, but I Very. have loved it. 
<laughs> Strong women scare me. I know a lot of people are going, Christy's leaving. Will we still get the washed up white guys all the time? The answer is yes. <laughs> Don't worry. But Christy, you will be da- badly, badly missed. Uh, thanks. I really loved it. It's a privilege to be here with you guys and all your audience. It's been really fun. So thanks. All right. Great. We'll, we'll see you so soon. Much. I'd like to thank our presenting sponsor, TELUS. I'd like to thank our sponsor, CN. I'd like to alert any potential sponsors that we have spots on the Daily Curse of Politics that are available. Should you be interested in advertising on Curse of Politics, reach out to uh, uh, contact at airquotesmedia.com. I almost forgot. Contact at airquotesmedia.com. That's your solution. Thank you, everybody, for listening this week. We'll see you Monday morning with the first of our Ontario election edition and pine for Christy while she's gone. Thank you.